constantly consider to be profound and absolutely worth your attention. And it wasn't until Freud that we again began to pay attention to these mad ramblings and interpret them as though they might contain something worth understanding. Something worth understanding. So there are far worse things than being mad. And one of them is to be in a culture that is mad and to consider yourself sane. That's worse. To be involved in a consensual hallucination of normalcy is much worse than being mad. So maybe I, maybe I would like to valorize madness in this way. I mean, in, in the plays of Shakespeare, which I will now briefly discuss because I didn't mean to imply ever that I didn't enjoy them. Has anyone ever noticed how frequently Shakespeare makes use of the fool? to deliver the wisdom. Dialectically and brilliantly, Shakespeare will have the fool sort of skip onto the stage and deliver the wisdom. Even in Hamlet, the gravedigger who plays, the fool in Hamlet is dead. See, Hamlet's a dark play. York is the king's gesture. He's dead already, but the gravedigger does not stand in for him in the scene. He delivers some of the real wisdom of the play. Throughout Shakespeare, we have these fools, madmen, jugglers, gestures, clowns, delivering the real wisdom of the play. And, and, and it, it's, it's perverse to see a culture that then takes some of this Shakespearean wisdom, you know, whatever, from the canon and sort of perverts it. I mean, I remember uh, studying Shakespeare and, and uh, I, they gave me this quote to remember from Polonius, you know, to thine own self be true. This could be the first line of every 12-step plan or therapy. To thine own self be true, and it follows as the night the day that thou cannot then be false to any man. Of course, in the context of the play, you realize that Polonius is a bureaucrat, a politician, a windbag, a blowhard, shallow, stupid, and his wisdom is, as I said earlier, just exactly the banality of a common mind. But yet, you know, grade school, we teach this. See how, see how smart Shakespeare was? Yeah, he was smart enough to show that that wasn't wisdom. That kind of commonplace crap wasn't wisdom. He was that smart and more. Well, anyway, uh, Nietzsche, uh, uh, in, in search of other self-descriptions and in search of new myths to replace the dying old ones, myths that we could, as it were, participate in and perhaps enjoy an enhanced life rather than, you know, in the case of many of these uh, therapeutic approaches, uh, put an end to the struggle of subjectivity by putting an end to our own subjectivity. Uh, one of the, the fascinating and, I mean, absolutely uninterpretable books of Nietzsche's that I intend to discuss briefly is Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which is about four or five things at once, at least, as a text. One is a rather extended and humorous parody of the Bible, the New Testament. Sorry, I mean, it's a rather, you know, it's the Sermon on the Mount is parodied by having Zarathustra, the religious seer and sage, give his Sermon on the Mount to a group of cows. I mean, making the point, I guess, that certain kinds of wisdom aren't appropriate for certain kinds of audiences. Whatever, I don't know. But in any case, uh, Zarathustra constitutes this beautiful parody in that way. On the other hand, it is beautifully written and it is an exemplification of what Nietzsche calls the gay science. Rather than talking about the gay science, Zarathustra is a text that is supposed to enact it, as it were. Sort of enact the gay science and say, well, in the act of self-creation, free beings, these so-called ubermenches, which I hate that word because of all its associations, Superman, you know. Well, anyway, the, these free beings, new creating beings, will write texts like this one, Zarathustra. Exciting, interesting. Well, at one level, it's that too. It's, it's a sort of self-indulgent uh, text, and it's certainly one that I enjoyed more, and this isn't, I uh, don't mind admitting this, that I enjoyed more when I read it when I was 18 than when I reread it years later. It has a certain adolescent fascination for it, for us. It's an, it has a certain kind of adolescent fascination. That's true of a lot of the text of Nietzsche, and I don't want to put that down. The reason I don't is because one of the fascinating things about these multiple kinds of texts by Nietzsche is that adolescent fascination effect that it has for youth 
and creativity and interest. T.S. Eliot, in a famous uh, critical piece on Hamlet, said that Hamlet was a failed play because Shakespeare tried to express in drama these overblown adolescent sentiments that could not be, you know, correctly placed within the form of art. Uh, well, that's true, but hardly reduces the interest to us of the Hamlet character. It hardly is a critique of his dialogue with himself that he's an adolescent. I mean, for me, it's not, and if it's a flawed play, then we, we wish to God more flawed plays were written that were that interestingly flawed. So I think Eliot was a bit of a prig about this as he was about most things. In any case, uh, uh, the, uh, the Dance of Zarathustra is not a ten-point plan. It's, it's not, it's not self-help, and you won't find your authentic self reading Zarathustra. You are supposed to, A, have a good time reading it, B, get a laugh out of it, and C, be challenged by it to try to see if you can remember enough of your own adolescence, perhaps to either scribble something down or do something a little wild. Several and multiple effects can come out of reading this text. Many and multiple effects can come out of reading it. Uh, I mentioned that, that uh, one parody scene where Zarathustra's wisdom, uh, uh, his famous Sermon on the Mount, is given to, uh, to a group of cows. There's another uh, particularly uh, uh, humorous part that I like. It's in the opening when, uh, as in many religious myths, of which Zarathustra purports to both be one and a criticism of one and a joke about them, all three, uh, Zarathustra, like you know, many religious myths, begin with the, the prophet, the seer, the person of wisdom, separated, sort of like Jesus in the desert, then he comes back and begins his mission. Buddha, under the tree, long time sitting, gets up, starts his mission. Well, Zarathustra starts, Zarathustra's all alone, except for his eagle and his snake. I don't know what they mean. They're just characters in the thing. I mean, they mean a lot of things. He's got a snake around his neck and an eagle. He goes down, and the first person he meets is he goes to share his idea of the death of God and the birth of these new festivals in this wonderful poetic book. And the first person he meets is an old hermit in the woods. And the old hermit, and he discuss religion and gods and things. And, and uh, Zarathustra, uh, uh, he asks Zarathustra to, uh, you know, uh, give his gift to, uh, you know, to everyone and so on. And, and Zarathustra goes, uh, no, I, I, I can't give you a gift. In fact, if I keep talking to you, I, I will probably take something from you. And then he leaves. And, and then he thinks to himself about the old man. He goes, can it be this old man hasn't heard about the death of God? Uh, it's just, yeah, and you're going, well, geez, that's a hell of a way for a, a myth to start, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, the old man in the forest stays there, I guess, throughout the rest of Zarathustra. And he goes into the marketplace and begins to, you know, say the kind of weird, hyperbolic, bizarre things with which Zarathustra is filled. I'll share a few of those with you. I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to do a detailed reading of it. It's, it's, it's too complicated. It's too intricate. And so I'll just give you a little taste for it and hope that you will uh, read it at some point. So I say that the best point to read it, many of us have passed. And that's in terms of enjoyment. Read it when you're 17 or 18 and just wow, you know, really like it, enjoy it, and get off to it. Uh, that fascination effect, I'll call it. But uh, one, one, of the, one of the scenes I like a lot 